Your whole life is just a dream. Now I am immortal. I think you've been afraid all your life. Now open your mind to me. It's a dream. You have always been here. It's a dream. Happy heresies, my beloved true seekers. Like a gathered pantheon of gods in the becoming, which you are in cosmic essence when you verily begin to know yourself, welcome so much to Aeon Bite, the only weekly radio show in the multiverse on Gnosticism, the Gnostics, and Gnosis, as well as their brethren in the Esoterica. Welcome so much to that dream of you, that sanctuary from the storms of counterfeit reality we face every day. Broadcast through the God Above God dot cam. I think you're confusing nice and evil again. Our journey continues through the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy to the farthest shores of imagination on this approximately Saturday, January 24th, the year of our demiurge 2009. We continue to immerse ourselves in all the streams of the esoteric baptismal waters until each one of you can find your own recondite Rosetta Stone in deciphering that secret, silent language that would lead you to Gnosis, that salvific knowledge, that illusion castrating insight, that acquaintance to the divine that quenches that horrible thirst for wholeness we've learned to accept all of our lives Lives, but never realize how bad it was in the deserts of Jehovah, where we, like the ancient Israelites, are wandering in exile. Blasphemers, idolaters, for this you shall drink bitter waters. God has set before you this day his laws of life and good and death and evil. One more step with me if you would. One more mile through the sandstorms of materialism and implanted agendas with your psychopomp and Mr. God known as Abraxas. Soon enough, perhaps tomorrow or in a million years, we'll reach that promised land, which in quintessence is the innermost chambers of your soul, where our God spark lies dormant. And then it will awaken and lead us through the desert of the Cosmocrater, past the zodiac heavenly houses guarded by the Archons of Fate, and finally beyond the outer darkness of creation to our supernal home of homes we call the Pleroma, the Kabbalists call Ein Sof, the Buddhists call Nirvana, William Blake called Albion, and the Enochian magicians call the Aether. We're born alone, we die alone. Everything else can be fixed with Photoshop. In this next important step, or in this internal now, we fathom some of the occult secrets of the founding fathers of the remarkable experiment called the United States of America. I'm telling you, Jorge, the first thing you have to do when you get to America, buy a device called TiVo, okay? Freedom means nothing if you're a slave to regular programming, I promise you that. Our guest is Dr. Robert Hieronymus, discussing two of his books, The United Symbolism of America and Founding Fathers Secret Societies. Both works are mercurial, intellectually honest and well-researched endeavors on the arcane face of the creation of America, as well as dispelling some of the concocted folklore many of us have taken for granted. Robert has also dedicated years documenting his dueling with the polemics that have fed the bellies of both fundagelicals and New Age conspiracy theory buffs. The more you make a big deal out of denying something, the more people think it must be true. Our interview is but a mosquito bite on the skin of his investigations, and Robert admits that even his book had to be truncated because he had gathered just too much information for his publisher to print. But you can find most of his discoveries at UnitedSymbolismOfAmerica.com. Again, UnitedSymbolismOfAmerica.com. 
beyond our interview, you'll be pleasantly cold-cocked at such revelations like the history behind the Liberty Bell, the Washington Monument, the Jefferson Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, and so much more. For example, and as a morsel, the city of Washington, D.C. was designed based on the corridor, shafts, inner architecture, and geometry of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Robert reveals this evidence in both data and illustration. Or did you know that the name America has more to do with Atlantis than some explorer? Like I said, after studying Robert's work, you'll wonder what in the Hades were they teaching you at school besides learning not to be an individual or think for yourself. You know, it's people like you who make the world think that Americans are stupid! Oh, we're not stupid! And we're not gonna take this shit anymore! The Founding Fathers were men of their times, already great or called to greatness by the providence of the higher realms. Some belonged to secret organizations or were very aware of them. Both Jefferson and Ben Franklin, who was also a Rosicrucian, attended a Masonic lodge in Paris that taught the Gnostic Hermeticist philosophies. Many of them were deists, appreciated mystical Judaism including the Kabbalah, as Robert proves in his books, and were very interested in all sort of non-Western concepts, including Native American culture and government. So my father once said to me, if you don't choose the things you believe in, they choose you. But what is perhaps most important is that they were the sons of the Age of Enlightenment. In other words, the neoclassic revival was ingrained in them. They were very at home with Greco-Roman ideals, ancient pagan architecture and art, and, of course, the magic of symbolism. It was part of the fabric of the educated back then, although throughout American history it has shocked the Orthodox. Thus, in this context, we can appreciate their thoughts, expressions, and ciphers without having to careen over into the Jack T. Chick or David Icke's dimensions where America was founded by satanic magicians, alien lizard overlords, or completely dominated by the nefarious yet non-existent secret cabals like the Illuminati. I haven't got a brain! Besides being men of their times, called to bring out the best of their times, Robert in his book and website reveals a simpler path where the triumph of the collective unconscious breathing out a new age and the sometimes lucky accidents of history have as much a part to play as anything else. Furthermore, Robert's books divulge that there was an evolution after the revolution that is ongoing until today. The American flag has been tweaked with, along with the Liberty Bell, the Dollar Bill, the Great Seal, the development of Washington, D.C., and other living archetypes of the American identity, just as much as the government has changed since those colonial times. We'd like to think these men in wigs and gay socks just wave their wands and a virgin nation materialize, much like Superman's fortress after he threw a crystal in the ocean, but that is not the case. And the secret battles between Freemasons and Fundagelicals has raged in these changes, as Robert's books point out. A toast, yeah? To high treason. That's what these men were committing when they signed the Declaration. Had we lost the war, they would have been hanged, beheaded, drawn and quartered. And, oh, oh, my personal favorite. Had their entrails cut out and burned. <laughs> so, here's to the men who did what was considered wrong in order to do what they knew was right. And one last point I must make in my drivel is to understand the power of symbolism. Like Joseph Campbell said, a symbol points to the transcendent. A symbol, in its many interpretations, is the menu, not the meal. The symbol is the road sign, not the city itself. The same goes with mythology and metaphors. All three direct one. 
into an eminent reality and that reference points will all perspective works for your spiritual emancipation. Once your inner logos is stimulated by the symbol and your mind interprets it in a context that works to soften your ego, then you must intuitively take those steps that will lead you to an ascended state of consciousness or at least a more unified state of being. Mulder, the truth is out there, but so are lies. There are many rewards in living the symbolic life, and one of those is for you to enter the stream of life with a new awareness and vitality. How you get there depends on the mysteries you have mastered, and hopefully the spiritual instincts you have learned to listen to. I wish I could explain it better, but just think of symbols in your life that reoccur, or those that have brought awe into your heart. Think of your dreams, think of synchronicities, think of memories without form that keep haunting you. Then let go and let God, as they say in AA. Remember, no matter where you go, there you are. But don't get stuck on the menu. Both the Founding Fathers and Gnostics were syncretic in their attitudes, understood the best parts of the classic Greco-Roman period, utilized mythology and the esoteric when it needed to be used, knew that in every person existed a part that no material agency could or should own, believed that freedom was the ultimate apex of existence, and use the gentler aspects of Christianity and Judaism to cultivate tolerance in a brutish world of powers and principalities and their playground bullying. People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. And they both believed in spiritual and intellectual evolution and revolutions. Is that is what is happening these days, my beloved truth seekers? I'd like to think so. The revolution in the name of Hypatia has just begun. The Gnostic revival is our best chance against the incoming Katrina of religious fundamentalism and stormtrooper secularism and the many weird social movements and ideologies that have become even more oppressive dogmas than the last two. And one of our best weapons, as Gnostics believed, is to go back to how anything started why it started, what might have gone wrong, and what was the true essence of the beginning of any start. How can you find the end if you don't know the beginning, Jesus asks in the Gospel of Thomas. I think for people concerned with what the USA has become, this is a very essential question right now. Perhaps it's time to get back to the basics of the Founding Fathers. If more of our so-called leaders would walk the same streets as the people who voted them in, live in the same buildings, eat the same food instead of hiding behind glass and steel and bodyguards, maybe we'd get better leadership and a little more concern for the future. But enough of my drivel. Dr. Robert Hieronymus discussing the symbolism and esoteric ideas that gave us the latest empire in history, for better or worse. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future security. People don't talk that way anymore. Beautiful. Huh. No idea what you said. With us today, we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Robert Hieronymus to discuss his book, uh, The United Symbolism of America, and some of the secrets of the Founding Fathers, and uh, what role they played in their secret societies. How are you doing today, Bob? Great. I'm doing, I'm doing a B plus, headed towards an A minus. <laughs> well, good, good. I think we can all get to an A plus uh, at the end of the interview. First of all, what exactly is or to you or do you mean by an, the esoteric definition of a symbol? All symbols have multiple levels of meaning. 
and uh, that's enormously important to remember. And uh, there's a uh, when, when you talk about esoteric symbolism, uh, a lot of people would like to refer to that as something that is hidden, hidden symbolism, so, something that goes deeper, that's not so readily apparent. But it, it's it's more than that. Something that's esoteric seems to be part of our inner being rather than just our exoteric, as the exoteric. So you, you would have, if you have the history of the United States, say, for instance, the flag. Uh, who designed the American flag exoterically? You would, most people are taught to believe it was Betsy Ross. Obviously, it wasn't. Uh, but a, a more esoteric view, but actually an historically accurate view, is Francis Hopkinson said, did. However, it, it, it goes beyond that because there are meanings within the symbolism which aren't readily apparent and can only be reached through higher levels of awareness. So I am prejudiced in the, this area, thinking, believing that when we talk about esotericism, that we're talking about a level of meaning that is not readily apparent, however, through reflection and through study, the deeper meanings are found within anything that's esoteric, while the more exoteric tradition, the traditionally accepted historical tradition, touches on just the externals and not the internals. And, and so therefore I believe also that there is a link between anything that's esoteric and higher levels of consciousness and awareness. That's my bias. So these symbols can actually help us uh, in our transformation to become whole human beings if we are aware of them, right? That's absolutely, that is one of the most important statements over the decades of doing radio and being interviewed. That, what you've just <laughs> said, you. is enormously important because the consciousness is really who we are, not our physical bodies. Uh, there's a strong bias in our media that the physical world is all that exists. Well, that, you know, when I was 19 and 20, and of course all of us go through the atheist and agnostic, uh, pers you know, growth and development, then, then I can understand why people would see it that way. But more importantly, when we take a look at any symbol, the, the higher the consciousness, the higher the awareness, the more well, deeply, we can get into its other levels of meaning, which basically all come down to self-transformation, the transcendence of the, of, the, um, of, of, of the physical and into the more spiritual dimensions, which symbols allow us to do. Because as Sir Francis Bacon and others have said so many times, that uh, the value of symbols is that they can hide uh, or they can... They can reveal to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. But if you don't have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, you're going to miss basically what that symbol is relating to. And that especially is true when we take a look at a symbol like the pyramid and the eye in a triangle. This, in my opinion, is the penultimate symbol of self-transcendence that our founding fathers put together regardless of whether they were conscious of it or not because you have a statement here of the pyramid which is a physical element which is a monument we don't well we don't know specifically all the meanings importance of the pyramid of course we've all heard of the, the tomb but chances are it was more or less a temple more or less a temple of initiation and had other functions as well, uh, geological, geographical, astronomical, astrological, etc. So, in my opinion, and again, I got to say, I'm biased in this area. Uh, in my opinion that the self-transcendence is what every human being is put on planet Earth and elsewhere, by the way, to, to accomplish. That seems to be what our, our goal is as we are in this physical body. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, we actually are spiritual beings encased, incarcerated, and so to speak, in a physical body. And I don't mean to offend uh, your listeners or yourself in this, in this area, but that I, that's where I believe we, we have missed, especially in our educational institutions in the Western world, 
uh, miss that t- totally. They, they think of us basically as just a physical body, and uh, because of uh, being physical, but all things that are material are, are really the key to our existence, when in actuality we're just passing through those. So uh, sorry for this very long. Oh, no, no, you sound very but, Gnostic, Bob. Uh, but the, uh... Uh, but, yeah, that's because, that's because <laughs> that the key to um, uh, uh, understanding who we are and why we're here is, is exactly the big question. Every human being has a personal destiny. Uh, there's a meaning to their life. And, and, of course, you can take a look at some of the great psychologists and folks that I studied, not under, but whose works I studied of the work of Carl Jung or Abraham Maslow, but especially Dr. Viktor Frankl and, and, uh, and Joseph Campbell and others who basically said that, hey, that the human beings are on a quest. And what is that quest? The quest is to find out who they are, why they're here, and what they're supposed to do about it. And I believe in the traditions of, of the secret societies that that's basically what their science was about. That, that is, finding out how, who they were, are, why they're here, and what is their purpose. What are they going to do about it? Because if, you know, there's a, the whole symbolism of uh, the, uh, the, the triangle, the triangle, especially in relating to, to, to human beings of, of uh, the triangle of of the inner and the outer, and uh, the com- the combination of the inner and outer coming out into meaning or purpose in life. So, uh, it's my belief that the symbols that you find, not just in American symbolism, but other to to the ancients especially, was all about trying to find out exactly why you're here and what you're supposed to do about it. Just like Joseph Campbell's whole hero's journey, which is, you know, you got a problem. Uh, if you're living at home, it's not working out well, you decide that, hey, you know, I don't think I'm going to grow and develop being here in this physical body, in this physical home. Uh, I'm going to leave home and go out and search for who I am. You go out into the world and you struggle with that, that um, uh, 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 desire to learn who you are and what you are, and when you do finally find it, then it is your purpose to take that gold, gold symbolically, to take that information, take that knowledge, and bring it back into the uh, physical world so that the, the triangle the, that I'm referring to is prayer. Prayer is speaking to, to say, the deity, or the, there are many different levels of that, Meditation, which is listening, and then finally, the key, I believe, is service to others, helping others, taking that information of what you have learned and sharing it with others freely. It's, uh, it's not the kind of thing that you can go out and buy. It is readily available when you go through this particular process of the hero's journey that Campbell and others have referred to. And all of the secret societies going back thousands of years, if we're going back to ancient Egypt or Samaria or, and, or, or even before that or even after that. It was basically finding out why you are here and what you're to do about it and to serve others. I know that's oversimplified and I know that sounds a little bit corny to most people, but I believe that that's um, when you have uh, an immortal component within your being uh, that, that is necessary for you to utilize who you are and what you're doing so that others can also find that same knowledge or find that same goal without being, being uh, told what to do about it. Because this is a search that's really very personal and that we all go through it. And uh, you can't have somebody else do it for you. You know, it, it is something that, is something that you must do yourself. But our Western tradition has ignored that for centuries. But now, especially within the last 40 or so years, we're slowly, and I mean really slowly, moving into the direction of human beings being, recognizing the fact that all of us are important, that all of us have a purpose. But how in the world do you find out what that purpose is? It's not going out and making sure that you have, well, uh, 12 uh, BMWs and seven homes, like some of our uh, individuals who... I'd like to are running for, or did run for president at the time, but still not even knowing how many homes they have. 
uh, <laughs> shows you the importance of less importance of the physical in regards to the, the um, uh, other dimensions. And and when you take a look at all of the symbolism, I've always particularly liked the symbol of the serpent. Uh, Bob, serpent. before we get into uh, the symbol um, um, of the serpent, which uh, definitely ties in with the following follows, the, the key that somebody would ask is you, you talk about the pyramid. What about the great eye over the pyramid? What does that symbolize? There are, again, it's multiple levels of meaning here, but uh, what the founding fathers who designed the Great Seal said it was, what they said that is providence, that is the deity, that is the supreme being. That symbol of the eye in a triangle um, has been really, when you go up, up on the Internet and translate it into some of the, the most negative bunch of stuff um, by individuals who have really very little knowledge about that in this particular area. Uh, the eye, of course, being the single eye, there's another level of meaning here, because as above, so below, as within, so without. That single eye of the deity, and if we have the deity within us, and I do believe we do, then that single eye is our guide to the higher dimensions. And, of course, you can call that what you will, but it is a spiritual being within us. Um, and that triangle, just like Buckminster Fuller kept pointing out that the strongest structures throughout the universe are, are made of tetrahedrons and triangles. A uh, triangle is a very, very strong symbolism. Of course, there are so many levels you can look at that. If you're going to Hegelian philosophy or Hegelian doctrine of, of uh, the, the triangle as a symbol for a thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis, you still come to that same idea that it is a balance. And I believe this synthesis or this balance is what all human beings need to find in their life. And that is balancing the, the spiritual with the physical. Not denying the physical, not denying the spiritual, but bringing them in balance. In an American symbolism, that eye in the triangle, which is spirit, and the pyramid, which is the physical temple, it can be compared to the body. It can be com compared to to um, the housing or the mother symbol, symbol symbolism. Some others like to refer to it as the human breast, uh, except uh, all mountains are related to, to breasts from that standpoint, that you have this balance between male and female because we as human beings are not just all male or, or all female. Uh, it goes generally in the something like about 51% of me in this particular physical incarnation, even though I am a, uh, am a male, I have at least 49% of me that has all the elements of femin the feminine. And it's just a reverse generally with, with, um, with women and the same proce procedure there. And it is that balance of bringing together the uh, spirit and matter which is important. And, and you look again, when I touched on the sy symbolism of the serpent, that's extremely important, not just to the founding fathers who put it on their flags and, and their mottos and things like that, but um, one particular symbol that I've always liked uh, by the ancient was, was the, uh, the, the symbol of the serpent on the pole, or today we see it is, as the caduceus, of uh, the two serpents intertwined balancing of the, uh, of the positive, the negative poles, or they refer to them, or the masculine and feminine, uh, or conscious or unconscious balancing. I believe that the symbols of America can all be based on this kind of a polarity, this duality, which comes into balance. And we could touch on that a little later on, but I think it's really key here in understanding that we are not just physical uh, and we're not just spiritual, we're both. And that really puts us in a, a most unusual place within the universe uh, having that particular free will, um, because other higher beings, if we refer to other higher beings, and such as the, uh, let's say, such as the various levels of angels, they do not have that freedom. Uh, they're they're restricted. We have more freedom than they have. Of course, it seems to us that they have far, far more power than we have. But I, I believe that's only because we are semi-conscious of our our abilities. 
this definitely leads to a very important point. Um, as you speak in your book, you know, the joining of the male and the female, you bring up the Kabbalah and a lot of things in American uh, symbolism. But uh, could you tell us a little bit about the history behind the construction of the Statue of Liberty? Well, you know, um, Bartoldi, who is basically the, the sculptor of um, the Statue of Liberty, somewhere, oh, about 1860s, 1870s, Bartoldi had been thinking for quite a while that he would like to erect a kind of a, a monument, a monument reflecting the ancients, when he wanted it first to, to put it in the Suez, uh, in, in Egypt. Um, and this, as a matter of fact, we do show some of the uh, photographs of, of, of his initial statues, which were, which were um, given to and um, presented to the Egyptian government, but they didn't have the money to follow through. Uh, and uh, then he thought, well, where else can we select this this, this statue to liberty? Um, and, of course, he then came to America because... Uh, they were having some severe problems in France at that particular time. Uh, he came to America, and uh, he's, uh, his first time he saw uh, the island upon which uh, the Statue of Liberty is presently, he said that's where it should be. And he had to raise the funds, obviously, to do this. Now, he wasn't a Freemason when he began this particular process. He had a lot of Freemasonic friends, and Freemasonry in France certainly is a lot different uh, uh, than Freemasonry in America, especially then, in that particular time. And so he really, really wanted to, to then figure out, how in the world can I tie America into France? You know, France was the second republic. That is, America established itself, and then France attempted to follow, but fell into a revolution which was never-ending, um, almost seeming never-ending. And so he felt, at that time... France also had lost its way. It had broken away from the republic and turned more into a, a semi-monarchy, uh, moving more and more towards um, a monarchy. And what he and his friends, who were Freemasons, wanted to do was to establish a statue in America so that would point the way to for France. In other words... They were looking to getting America's support for their republic by giving us a statue uh, that basically told the story of what liberty was all about. And, of course, that took a very long time to do, uh, but he, uh, he eventually did succeed. Now, when you take a look at it from that perspective, uh, when this statue was first to propose to America, everyone was pretty excited about it. But no one wanted to chip it, <laughs> no one wanted to pay for it. And that's what led to the involvement, especially, of uh, the, the people of the United States uh, in, the, in raising the funds, because they just couldn't get it. They couldn't get the money from New York. They couldn't get it from the, the government. They had, had to go to directly to the people who sent their dimes and pennies and nickels in, in over the period of time. Now, why in the world is this so important, this particular statue? Because... What was happening in the world today was that then was the understanding that women, women were extremely, uh, they had been literally shut out of, of any of uh, uh, in political, uh, governmental involvement and couldn't, couldn't vote. And uh, they were basically thought of as, as being, well, much less than they really were. So the, this movement towards, towards uh, having women uh, participate in government was enormously important, especially since, and I know we don't have time too much to talk about what happened to the League of the Iroquois and the, and the control that women had uh, within the government of the Iroquois that the founding fathers had learned about. But that was one of the big mistakes that our, our, our founding fathers made. They made two huge mistakes. One, slavery. Two, the rejection of, of um, women being uh, able to, to participate in government. But this statue is a goddess. There's no two ways about it. She is a goddess. Now, unfortunately, if you go on the Internet today, there are a lot of individuals who, who basically have said that the statue is satanic. Yeah. Uh, or she's ISIS. 
or, right. yeah, or she is ISIS. Now, she is related to ISIS in, in, in some ways, but to, that's not all she was or is, because by and large, if you take a look at the symbols around her, um, the, I'd like to point out two that are extremely important in regards to balance that some people may not be thinking about. One, she is holding in her right hand the, the hand uh, that governs activity in the physical world, the, the hand that is uh, more external, exoteric than anything else. It is a torch. That torch is enlightenment. She is holding forth enlightenment. How come she has, at, why is she activating this torch? Because by and large, when you take a look at who she is, this feminine goddess, she has a crown of seven points on her head. And of course, if you talk to uh, those of, uh, on, on, on the, the interpret that seven, externally, exoterically, they would say, you know, that's the seven continents, that's the seven oceans. But, of course, uh, the guy that gave us the Statue of Liberty and created it uh, wasn't thinking about that at all. Seven is a very sacred number. It, and is a symbol, basically, of, of victory and, and, and completion of. She has been uh, liberty, illuminating. She is illuminating the world with wisdom. She is wisdom. And, and if we get into the esoteric aspect of it, of, of um, this seven chakras or seven levels of being or seven levels of consciousness, she represents that and a great deal more. But that's her right hand. In her left hand, she is holding a, well, it's a tablet. A lot of people like to think of it as a book. It can be interpreted as a book. But on it is the date in Roman numerals, July 4, 1776. This book literally is about what America was. What was, is America? America basically is the reintroduction of a republic, the founding of a republic. And what is a republic? A republic is a representative form of government as opposed to a monarchy, as opposed to um, an oligarchy. Uh, and uh, basically, and also we believe that you should separate church from state. That is really a key for any republic, because without that, you have loss of freedom of religion and control of your spiritual thoughts by, by uh, specific um, religions. And, and uh, that, in my opinion, is, is the, one of the wisest things that uh, Thomas Jefferson did in 1786, was to make sure that within the Virginia Constitution that we had that freedom of religion. Because if you go to his monument, the Jefferson Memorial, erected in 1943 in Washington, D.C., of course, you, you'll see that basically his emphasis is upon we do not want to be in bondage. We do not want to allow our, our spiritual beliefs to be dictated by some other particular force. Um, and I think that that, unfortunately, uh, is the kind of thing that today, uh, especially with this last administration, we have in part lost. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why you see, especially on the Internet, so much misinformation that America basically was founded as a Christian nation, which is not true. It's not true at all. There's no... There's no, I understand the reasons why they are saying that, because just because many there were many more Christians in America uh, than other religions, it was no reason why. Or that's not the reason why um, our, our nation was founded. We actually were founded to give us the kind of freedoms that we have. So that date is the rebirth in the left hand of the, the of, of the Statue of Liberty of the Goddess. Uh, which brings balance to the illumination. What, in other words, what is illumination? What is the higher spiritual belief that is a republic, the founding of republic so that we do have that kind of freedom? Now, of course, there are other symbols within the Statue of Liberty that are, are super important. But the reason why I want to bring these two up is because the left hand is the receiving hand. The left hand uh, is, is that which which if a healer is laying on hand, they receive the energy in that hand, and they send out energy that's in their right hand. Again, it's this balance between that which is internal, that which is 
external as above, so below, or esoteric, exoteric, as, as we begin to began to, to discuss earlier in, in our conversation here. So the Statue of Liberty literally is a goddess which is us. We literally are gods and goddesses if we can elevate our awareness, bring that energy of spiritual energy up into our body, this, and, and, and gives us glimpses of the heaven world, the higher dimensions of consciousness. Um, I've really oversimplified this, uh, but I believe uh, what I've said is accurate in the sense of the importance of liberty, especially the freedom of um, giving freedom to, to um, um, women, not just in voting, but in, t in participating within our government, which I believe is going to make great changes in, in the uh, years to come, uh, because I think that they are much more sensitive to giving up, uh, going to war, and, and losing, because a, a human being that gives birth to a child that nurtures and cares for it is going to appreciate a good deal more what life is all about from the standpoint of what needs to be protected and cared for. Um, and so, therefore, wars are the last resort, if ever. And, Bob, uh, you believe that uh, she's based mostly on the Roman goddess Liberta, right? Well, she can be interpreted as that, but no, I believe that what she is basically is everything we've ever thought about what goddess means. A more uh, universal symbol, okay. A universal symbol that is not tied into just one level of being, one level of, of thinking. There are at least, especially in regards to symbols, multiple levels of meaning. Uh, uh, you know, if you take a... If again, when you go up on the Internet and you see the, the symbol of the serpent, and it's being interpreted by individuals that I call fundamentalist conspiratorialists, they see it as an absolutely negative symbol of, of uh, the devil or Satan or some such thing that they make up, when in actuality, on multiple levels, it has a lot to do with the spiritual energies. And it's um, spiritual or any energy can be used for good and it can be used for evil. But I believe that unfortunate thing of saying that there's only one level of meaning to these symbols, therefore the founding fathers who brought us these particular symbols, like the serpent on, on various flags that we've had, are devil worshippers, Satan worshippers, etc., which I believe is totally off the mark and basically um, uh, destructive of, of our trying to bring human beings together as one, because I do believe that America, literally, was founded to establish a government which was a representative form of government that other governments would um, possibly uh, adhere to over a period of time. Not that we're supposed to force our way of government onto another nation. They, obviously, it's the other nations that need to accept that if they are going to accept it. They should have the freedom. And uh, moving on, Bob, another uh, very important symbol uh, in American history, uh, part of the Great Seal, is the is the is the eagle, the bald eagle, holding the uh, the arrows and holding the uh, what the olive branch. Olive branch. Yeah. yeah. Have, How did that come about, and uh, what 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 can we glean from it? This is all about balance. When you take a look at the eagle. And, of course, the symbol for America has always been an eagle, not necessarily a bald eagle, but an eagle. The Native Americans certainly used that symbol, and certainly the League of the Iroquois used it to represent government. When you take a look at this, and, and, and those of you who have a $1 bill, pull it out. You'll take a look on the back side, and you'll see that pyramid and the iron triangle on one side, the left, and on the right side, you'll see this the front side, the obverse. Now, the eagle has been is a symbol. There's multiple levels of, of meaning of the symbol, but I'm going to take it into the, the meaning of of literally, literally spirit, because and especially that which has to do with far seeing, because of the eagle's vision of being able to to see into actually look into the sun and look into spirit from that that aspect of it, but. 
but you can take a line and divide vertically the great seal obverse, that eagle side, down the middle, and you will see that it is, is precisely balanced. The eagle is looking towards the olive branch. It is looking towards the olive branch. Obviously, the olive branch is a symbol for peace, not just external peace, but internal peace. Um, that has to be emphasized. Uh, the eagle looking towards peace veins and saying that we, this is, this is the, the direction we should be moving. However, if you have any particular nation that's based on peace and that is not necessarily developing a method by which it can protect its peace, you could find yourself in deep trouble, as many nations that were peaceful nations were destroyed by barbarians coming in from left or right. So those arrows, those 13 arrows in the talon uh, behind the eagle's head symbolize the ability to protect peace. But the eagle's head's not looking towards it. They are, it it's turned away from it because that is your last resort. If you cannot establish peace and you cannot hold your peace, then literally you will need to protect yourself in one way or the other. And so, therefore, when you take a look at those olive branches and, 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 and arrows, you have, once again, olive branch is related to the feminine. It's related to nature. It's related literally to, to um, consciousness in, in many different ways. When you look at the, 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 the arrows, again, you have that Mars. You have a Venus-Mars balance here, the same way as if you would take a look at the eye in the triangle in the pyramid in which you have the more physical and the spiritual, a Venus and Mars there, more masculine, more feminine. That balance allows us, spirit and matter, to be able to elevate our awareness. And when you look at what is above the eagle's head, you see an extremely important pattern. You'll see, well, the first great seal of the United States had 13 stars, but their stars that they used in 1782 were six-pointed stars. Today, we have five-pointed stars. Some discussion, and has been discussion for many decades, over why did we change from a six-pointed star to a five-pointed star? Well, basically, because if you have a star that's in the heaven, in, in, the, in heraldry, you must have a six-pointed star. Six-pointed stars were to symbolize the stars in the heaven world, in heraldry. Uh, the five-pointed star was a star of the, the physical world, like flowers and, and uh, that which is vegetation. But now we have a 13, 13 five-pointed stars in a six-pointed star pattern. There again, when you go to the Internet, people take a look at this and they believe that what there's, we're not, you know, just tell us that we're a Jewish nation. Now, anyone who, <laughs> anyone who has studied symbolism realizes the multi-levels of meaning in a six-pointed star and the fact that the six-pointed star has been used thousands of years and, and, and throughout the planet. That has nothing necessarily to do with, with the, the Hebrew or Jewish tradition, even though, of course, the interlocking triangles is extremely important because it's like a little alchemical formula. And what is this alchemical formula? It's the upright triangle symbolizing fire, the inverted triangle symbolizing water. Um, again, you have the male-female aspect of it, and they, they are joined. They unite. It's a statement, literally, of, of the spiritual world impregnating the physical world, basically saying we are both, all human beings, literally, are both spirit and matter. It, it is uh, the five-pointed star, however, as I said, creates, there are 13 of them, and it creates a six-pointed star above the eagle's head. That could be and has been mistranslated by fundamentalist conspiratorialists as being, you know, hey, this is not a Christian symbol. Yeah, so something's wrong with our founding fathers here having, having used that. Well, of course, they didn't know heraldry and the realization that, that the, of the reason why they had to use a six-pointed star, which I simplified Simplified there. So when you take a look at this six-pointed star, it is encircled in a cloud, a, a, a circular cloud. Uh, and that circular cloud literally is, has been used as a symbol for a crown, a crown above the eagle. 
and it is literally what they're saying is that 13, those 13 stars united in one particular star means same thing as e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Of course, it would have been more interesting if we had left the six-pointed stars, 13 six-pointed stars in the six-pointed star pattern, but, but those who, who did not understand heraldry who came in and worked on the Great Seal of the United States in seven, 1841 and 1882 uh, did, not, did not go by the heraldry, uh, the, the laws of heraldry. Um, that, that can be seen as an error, or it could just mean something else, because I think that there are many different levels here when you look at that. So that eagle holding the balance of, of the arrows and the olive branch above its head, if you take a look above its head, uh, that is another point. You can actually draw and create a triangle from of that, those, that 13, those 13 stars, or what they used to be called, the crown of countless ages, ages uh, with, um, with the arrows and the olive branch. So that, again, you come back to that triangle, uh, the basic building block, the build, building structure of our universe, literally, from, in regards to the tetrahedron. So the eagle side, I look at as our, our, our phys the more of the physical world, our external, our exoteric face that we show the planet uh, in our pyramid behind the triangle, I basically see as the more esoteric, our inner being, a more feminine aspect of it. So that by and large you have, again, the reason why I believe Thomas Jefferson suggested a two-sided seal, one of the reasons why he wanted that was to reflect that, that we have a balance between the physical world and the spiritual world. And uh, Bob, I guess the $64,000 question is, how much did uh, the founding fathers being in secret societies uh, influence all of this symbolism? Is it uh, is the whole idea of them being in secret societies overrated? Or, as you point out, they were simply men of the times, men of the Age of Enlightenment, and they were very much into neoclassic uh, symbolism and architecture? Well, that's a good question, um, and it's a tough one, because... When I first discovered this pyramid in the eye in a triangle, it was about 1965, and I was sitting in the bathtub looking at my last dollar, and I saw this pyramid in the eye in a triangle, and I said to myself, where in the hell did this come from? I mean, it doesn't look American to me, uh, so what is this literally all about, this, this, this type of symbolism? And I started reading, because when I contacted the State Department, and I asked them, um, after the first six months, they said they they sent me a a the, the, the copy of the the front side of the Great Seal and not the Pyramid in the Iron Triangle. And I four months later, I asked them again. I said, you know, how about this Pyramid in the Iron Triangle? They didn't actually have any information, literally, that they wanted to share with me on that. Now that meant I had to go to other sources, and all of the sources that I had to cover were all basically esoteric sources, like Manley Palmer Hall, Paul Foster Case. Um, uh, the uh, Corrine Helen, Emmett Fox, etc. All of uh, and there's scores of them. We ha I have a bibliography that I'm very proud of because literally uh, I found sources that that I'm certain that most people thought never existed uh, 30, 40 years ago. But what it comes down to, when you take a look at this this uh, particular symbolism, is who designed the Great Seal of the United States? Now, one of the most important sources is an individual by the name of Manley Palmer Hall, who I have a great regard for. However, like all researchers, he made some mistakes. How many of the founding fathers were members of secret societies such as Freemasonry? If you believe what Manley Palmer Hall was saying, 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. That's a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is, that's a majority. I mean, that's... I mean, I've seen, I've seen uh, others say, hey, it wasn't 50, it was 55 of the 56 signers. I mean, that's a lot of folks. Now, uh, being an historian, um, I, I, I love that idea. And at the same time, I had a feeling <laughs> that something's wrong here. I mean, if so many of them were members of uh, secret societies like Freemasonry, well, why, why was that ignored? I mean, it's very obvious. 
So uh, literally, it took me a long time. And I mean, I, I spent, uh, there are a lot of people, especially in the old days of rock and roll, a lot of people were deeply in, interested in the Pyramid and the Iron Triangle. The little time that I spent with uh, Jimi Hendrix, especially, when I was going to be doing album covers, record album covers, um, we discussed the Pyramid and the Iron. It was a fascin to him. Just the same thing with individuals that I talked to with the Doors or or, or Tim Buckley or, or or Frank Zappa or all of them had a deep interest in this Pyramid and Iron Triangle. What, where in the hell did this come from? When you get to really good research, we find out this. It wasn't 50 of the 56. It was only nine of the founding fathers that were involved with Freemasonry. Now, I still a lot of people, but it's not a vast majority. Then I thought to myself, what's wrong here? Something's wrong here. I, I, didn't Manny Palmer Hall know that? Where, where did he get these numbers? I corresponded with him for five years. Uh, we never could get to, to the bottom of that particular problem. Um, but now it is confirmed. That was only nine of the 56. Then I started to question other things, because there were other statements that, that were made. And you see this again on, on, on the Internet, and I have to refer to that. And that is this, that the guys that designed the Great Seal of the United States were Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. Well, it's true. Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams were on the first committee. But... All of their ideas were rejected. Benjamin Franklin went to the Bible. Thomas Jefferson went to the Bible for their, their ideas. John Adams went, to, went literally to Greek mythology. None of them, none of the symbols on the great seal of the United States were, were brought up by these three great individuals. What does that mean? It means that since Benjamin Franklin was a Freemason, some believe Thomas Jefferson was a Freemason. That certainly can't be proven. Certainly John Adams was not. The statement that is made so many times that the three of these guys got together, they designed the Great Seal in 1776 because Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson was a Freemason. Therefore, the Iron the Triangle and the Pyramid were definitely Freemasonic symbols. I believe that. I was wrong. Because when you get further into the history of the Great Seal, it took six years, three committees, the guys that really put it together were Charles Thompson, Secretary of Congress, and William Barton. Were these guys members of any secret societies? No. So where did these symbols come from? They didn't come from Freemasonry. Later on, we find out that 30 years after, 30 years after the design of the Great Seal of the United States was approved, that we start seeing Freemasonry using the eye in the triangle. They always use the eye, like many secret societies have used the single eye. Some of them put it in a circle. Some of them didn't, they just put it in along amongst the clouds. But it wasn't until much later, when other secret societies later on, such as the OTO and, and Aleister Crowley and others, started using it on covers of their books, that most people began to think, hey, what, this eye in the triangle thing here, is basically a symbol for, for secret societies, and in particular, uh, Freemasonry, the Rosicrucians, uh, the Golden Dawn, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not true. It just looks that way. This was a big shock to me. i got to tell you, Angel, this was a big shock to me because I, <laughs> I uh, and it's very embarrassing to have to admit this, <laughs> but when I started writing back in 1968, on this particular, since I did not have the best sources historically, and nobody had the best so sources historically on the Great Seal of the United States until 1978. 1978 was published, The Eagle and the Shield, by the State Department, and this 700-page book is extraordinary in the sense of I had been needling the State Department for years. I had an ongoing battle with the State Department, saying to them, hey, what's wrong with you guys? Can't you tell that this is a Freemasonic symbol and that the Founding Fathers were Freemasons and therefore they borrowed this? And they, they did not like this idea. Later on, of course, then they, they did their research, and then I had to continue to do my research. And what we found out was, is just as I said, 
literally the guys that designed the Great Seal of the United States had no membership within Freemasonry. Why is there so much confusion on this? It, the reason why we have that confusion deals with the dollar bill, the one dollar bill, because it was in 1935 that most Americans were introduced to the pyramid and the eye and the triangle. And who introduced it to us? We have a whole group of Freemasons. We have, of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Henry Asgard Wallace, which who was uh, ended up being the vice president, was the secretary of agriculture. You had Henry Morgenthau, uh, who was, uh, and, and you had a whole slew of individuals that were Freemasons. And when they saw this symbol, they did exactly what I did and many, so many other people did. They say, my goodness gracious, this is a Freemasonic symbol. Therefore, since they were all Freemasons, let's put this on the back of the $1 bill and talk about the spiritual side of America. That is where, in 1935 onward, because the Republicans came down on them like, oh, the Republicans are now coming down on Obama, literally. Uh, they basically were making statements literally about them, uh, of, of, that there was a conspiracy involved here, and that meant to most other people that all the founding fathers were involved with this particular conspiracy. It's not true. Who was involved in that particular conspiracy? Our president, vice president, secretary of, uh, of um, uh, agriculture, and, and uh, uh, tr the Department of Treasury, and the guy who actually did the drawing, the engraving on our dollar bill, was also a Freemason. None of these guys hid that. It was all out in the open. That's one of the reasons why today there is so much confusion over how in the world did we get these symbols. They must be from some secret society. Yes, secret societies had a part in the founding of this country, but not necessarily the kind of part that, that uh, many, many individuals, especially uh, fundamentalists and conspiratorialists, like to believe. And uh, that, unfortunately, I, I, I apologize, literally, for misinforming so many rock and rollers back in the <laughs> old days, uh, you know, because we thought we had the solution, Miguel. We thought we understood it. That, that's one of the problems when you cannot go to primary documents. You know, and you're doing your research especially in anything esoteric or not, that you've got to try to get as close as you can to the, to the primary documents, the first sources. And uh, unfortunately, in Gnosticism, the church destroyed so much, uh, which was horrendous, absolutely horrendous, the wisdom that was lost because of that particular kind of thinking. Uh, the Christians literally destroyed that. Uh, so we have... It's a very complicated situation, and I'm glad I'm allowed to have enough time to explain it um, rather than, than to, um, well, skip over certain aspects of it. Because most talk show hosts would not necessarily want me to go into this kind of detail as to explain uh, what, it, what it is. But obviously, you know, if you really want to get to the facts of the case, I think you've got to do that. And uh, usually on radio, you don't have a chance. So, Bob, so basically, for the founding of the country, they just uh, they uh, drew upon many ideas. Like you said, they drew from the Iroquois, the, the classic period, Christian ideas, ideals, and other things in order to form a new nation. Yes, Is that indeed. what basically happened? They just took the best out of what they could. Yes, and of course, the Freemasonry was, is 100% supportive then, as it... Uh, uh, after the revolution, that is, then um, in, 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 you know, you, you talk to most Freemasons today, you find that almost every one that I've ever bumped into, uh, I'm a member of co-masonry, and I'm frowned upon uh, by some Freemasons because we believe, like the ancients did, that when you have rituals in, in, uh, in the Freemasonic rituals, that women should be involved in that, the same as uh, many Gnostics also felt the same way, uh, that you can't eliminate the, 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 the feminine consciousness from this, this aspect of it. So, uh, but, but, you know, I think when people see things like National Treasure or uh, other works of Dan Brown that are Hollywood versions of, of, of knowledge, we got to remember that we're being entertained. That <laughs> and I have... 
<laughs> and because you're being entertained, they're not going to, they're, they're not scholars. They're there, they're there, <laughs> there to make it as juicy as possible so the people take an interest and want to go because they just spent $182 million on a film. They, <laughs> they, have, <laughs> they, they realize that they'll put a lot of people to sleep. Uh, by getting into the more uh, uh, finer aspects of uh, these kind of interpretations and meanings. But, uh, you know, I've enjoyed these films a great deal, uh, but we know that they're not factual. Uh, but unfortunately, you have a lot of people that do believe that they are. And so, you know, when you saw National Treasure 2, when they uh, go out to uh, uh, South Dakota uh, to, to uh, uh, a river or a, or a, a lake, uh, that supposedly holds the gold from another civilization, they slowly find out that the closest body of water to, uh, to, to, the, to Mount Rushmore is, is like 30 miles away. That, that dawns on them at that time. They think, hey, I've been had. No, they haven't been had. <laughs> Lastly, Bob, what are some of the uh, misconceptions that... Uh what do you call it, conspiracy fundamentalists do? Um, obviously, one that you point out in your book is uh, they see the number 13 and they think it's satanic, when obviously it simply meant the 13 colonies. Well, yeah, there is a, a lot of that. But number 13, there are whole books on number 13 now. But 13, it was, as, as you probably know, was a sacred number to the Mayans. And, and, of course, that is the number of colonies that we had that made it into states. Let's face it. I mean, there wasn't 14. It wasn't 12. It was 13. Uh, 13 uh, is an extremely important symbol because, and I like, I like it especially because of its uh, a link to rebirth and regeneration. Uh, this rebirth that America may be uh, undergoing at this present time is extremely important. So, so that we get a, 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 a deeper view as to who we are, and and why why was our country founded, and what is you know this is an extremely important aspect that that the rest of the world now is looking at America as maybe they can respect us again. It's obvious that we went astray there, uh, for for reasons that some people may have thought were good, but to the rest of the world seemed to be the absolute opposite of who we were and what we were supposed to do, our purpose in, in establishing a, um, a, a, a republic, which is a representative form of government, uh, which uh, separates church and state. Because we know that when you combine them, you lose access. I mean, you, to me, it's always been, how in the world can you put to death or attempt to put to death someone like Galileo for looking through a telescope. You know, th that's, that's pretty uh, miserable from the standpoint of uh, what kind of people are you dealing with? Is it wrong to look uh, through a, a, a looking glass to see, to see what, re what physically is out there? I doubt it. But unfortunately, you know, you know what Galileo went through. You knew what Tycho Brahe and all the others uh, and, and, and so much, so much of the great, great uh, literature from Greece and Rome uh, having been destroyed because there were individuals that felt, well, if, if Jesus, Jesus didn't mention this, then it must not be important. If it's not important, then what are we, what are we bothering with it? Let's just get rid of this. That, I believe, uh, um, is still the same way that many, unfortunately, feel today in regards to the symbolism, certain symbols in America. So... Again, the multi-level meanings of, of any symbol, I think, need to be, to be reviewed. We touched on the Statue of Liberty, which is about balance, and we touched on the Great Seal of the United States, but you'll find that simplistically, when you make, take a look at the Liberty Bell, the Liberty Bell's shape and its actual dome itself uh, is, is a feminine symbol. The, the clapper on the inside is a, is a masculine symbol. It's like Venus and Mars all over again. Without the clapper, you can't make a noise. Without the dome, you can't make a noise. You need them both. Uh, that's why I think it's such a, a powerful symbol, this whole thing about balancing male and femaleness energies. And you have the same kind of thing within our first flags. You know, our first flags were based on the Sons of Liberty flags, which were just a red and white stripe. 
and the red and white stripe again. And you go to the symbolism of the red being related to Mars and, and white being related to moon or the Mars and Venus, the masculine and feminine. Um, that whole thing is about balance again. And when you study almost every symbol America has, it, it does, they all reflect that motto, e pluribus unum, out of money is one. Diversity is really the, the, our great blessing. Well, I think that's all the time we have today, Bob. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, coming on the show and uh, definitely giving us uh, an eye-opener. Well, indeed, thank you for having me, and I appreciate your allowing me to speak in such depth about these particular symbols. And by the way, um, those who are interested in the book United Symbols of America, you can the best price for it is at Amazon.com. It's in Barnes & Noble. But also... You can get a lot of the material free by going to our website, unitedsymbolismofamerica.com, because, as I said, this originally was like a six to 700-page book. So much was taken out of it, we decided we better post it on our website uh, because we thought that information was enormously important uh, for others to study. Yeah, and even without that, uh, your books certainly have... Uh quite a bit of scholarship and it's very exhaustive but again uh thank you very much for coming on the show and uh good luck with your books and hopefully we'll have you on soon i look forward to it thank you very much miguel you know the templars and the freemasons believed that the treasure was too great for any one man to have not even a king that's why they went to such lengths to keep it hidden that's right the Founding Fathers believe the same thing about government. I figure their solution will work for the treasure, too. Give it to the people. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. Robert Hieronymus on some of the more esoteric symbolism and ideas that went behind the creation and development of the USA. Again, he is the author of several books, although we focus primarily on The United Symbolism of America and Founding Fathers' Secret Societies. Two well-researched grimoires with plenty of illustrations to prove his very theories. And for what's in the book and even more, including the monkey shines of fundagelicals and New Age Napoleons, please visit his homepage United Symbolism of America dot cam. You'll also find information on his own radio station and other projects, some that have appeared on television. And from his own words, the next time you glance at the Statue of Liberty, think of an old Gnostic heroine and understand that she has always been with us one way or another. We spoke about symbols and their spiritual smelling salts. Seek them, and the path into the uppermost asylums of enlightenment will become easier. I mentioned this book recently, but again check out Stefan Heller's Alchemy for a Voluntary Society, or even his interview on Aeon Bite No. 2, back when it was called Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis. He certainly brings more evidence of the Gnostic hermetical influence on the founding of the USA. But don't let facts get too much in the way of enjoying the liberating narrative of the myth that was part of the birth of the USA. All history is fiction, as Alan Moore said, and in the end, the only truth that matters is what will set you free, increase your status as an individual, and help your brothers and sisters find their own light. And don't ever forget the accomplishments of the Founding Fathers, like all true seekers and free thinkers who do not blink at the god of this world, they tapped into the Gnostic spirit to some degree or another and became on the exterior another empire of so many empires, but on the interior a dream of man's godly potential and man's holy thriving in a seemingly frigid cosmos where all odds are hopelessly stacked up against them. And the battle for the American dream has only begun, my beloved true seekers. Can we, the heretics, the urban witches, the rebellious priesthood, techno-alchemists, and infernal artists give a hand? 
The choice is yours. Thomas Jefferson wrote his own gospel by editing the Orthodox Bible. George Washington lived his own myth by emulating his life after his idol, the Roman hero Cincinnatus. Thomas Paine was just a free-thinking badass who took no prisoners but liberated them. Why shouldn't you be an aspect of all or any of the three like the classic Gnostics? The divine spark in each one of us is what really makes us equal, and I think that's what Jefferson truly meant in the Declaration of Independence. I am, and I am Abraxas, broadcasting at the Virtual Alexandria through the GodAboveGod.com. The road is ended, the song is over, thought I'd have something more to say. But don't cultivate any troubles, my beloved true seekers. Because like heaven above you, the spy that loved you, I'm keeping all of your secrets safe with me tonight. Hello and goodbye as always. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chaka. This is Susan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chaka. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Kind of like a, oh, like an Aztec inspired kind of garden. And actually just been standing out here with the sun shining down in the middle of this rock circle. Um, just feeling the pulse of evolutionary history and my role in it as a woman and knowing you at this time and just releasing things and just holding that space that you were in last night and that I entered into and and that's a loving presence and we need to let go of striving and just let go so I'm with you and uh, I want you to take care and I feel I just want to thank you for the way that you've loved me so fully and freely Good morning, Mr. Chaka, the Susan. 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 Good morning, Mr. Chaka, the Good morning, Mr. Chaka, the Good morning, Mr. Chaka, Good morning. of like a, oh, like an Aztec-inspired kind of garden, and actually just been standing out here with the sun shining down in the middle of this rock circle, um, just feeling the pulse of evolutionary history and my you role in it as a woman, and knowing you at this time and just releasing things and just holding that space that you were in last night and that I entered into, and, and that's a loving presence, and we need to let go of striving. Good morning. And just let go. So, good morning. I'm with you and uh, I want you to take care and I feel, I just want to thank you for the way that you've loved me so fully and freely. Allah. Shalom. Shalom. Good morning. 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 Good morning.
Rastafari. Our Father. Amen. Good morning. Kind of like a, oh, like an Aztec inspired kind of garden and actually just been standing out here with the sun shining down in the middle of this rock circle. Um, just 